on three. It is Tuesday, September 3rd, 2024. And week one of the college football season is a fifth in the books. Uh, we have a week one win and some other big games across the country. And joining me to break it all down is Scoop Duck owner and publisher, Justin Hopkins. Justin, how are we doing? I'm certainly doing much better than the guy who bet that he would eat dog shit if FSU lost to Boston College. That's for sure. <laughs> that was a, a wild story for sure. Um, what a crazy time it is in co the college football world with uh, with Boston College knocking off, not knocking off the Seminoles because they were already they already came off of a loss there. But that was one of the wild games of the week for sure. And we have a bunch to talk about with Oregon getting their first one of the season over Idaho. A little bit close for comfort, I think, is an easy or light way to put it. 24-14 to 14 win over the Vandals at home in Eugene out there in Autzen Stadium. A warm day in Eugene. I know you were there with uh, with your grandma and some some of your family as well. So let's, uh, let's just get into some thoughts from that game. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously – it's a Tuesday. Normally you and I uh, would be talking about this sooner. You had some trips yesterday was Labor Day, just kind of a weird first weekend. We'll get in our groove. But yeah, here we are talking about Idaho. Um, and, you know, I know that uh, a lot of people have talked about already. We've written about it on the site and, uh, you know, no hot takes for me. Clearly, that wasn't uh, I love this term, really. It wasn't up to the standard of Oregon. And, and that's that's a great term. That's just a way to say, hey, look, we didn't perform at a level that, you know, we expect to or that is expected of us from our coaches and our fans and from media. So, um, you know, the best thing that I, I've kind of come to the conclusion is that, you know, that's I, I feel like Oregon fan base, the coaches, the players, uh, you know, they feel like they lost. But the good news is they didn't. They actually won the football game. So if they can win a football game, and, and, and get that feeling like, hey, man, we, you know, that, that wasn't the standard. We got to do better. That's a really good thing for Oregon. Now we got, we got to see that come into play, right? We got to see Boise State like, okay, was, you know, were you guys sleepwalking? Because it kind of looked like it. Looked like you guys were sleepwalking. Looked like you assumed that Idaho was going to show up and roll over and play dead. And clearly they and Coach Eck had a different plan of attack uh, in Eugene that day and give them 100% of the credit for getting up for that game, for executing, for doing all those things. Now, I've said this already on the board. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it really clear, okay? Uh, let's say that Oregon scheduled that game and it was against USC, right? Let's say Oregon was set to play USC that first game. Hypothetical, yeah, right? Okay. I'm confident that we would have seen a totally different version of Oregon had they been preparing for USC. And what I mean by that is they would have been up there would have been energy. There would have been a whole different team out there on the field that more than likely, instead of playing at level four, would have been playing at level eight or nine or 10 or whatever. So, you know, don't let uh, the fact that Oregon struggled against Idaho, again, put up almost 500 yards, move the ball, still scored 21, four, excuse me, 24 points, uh, kneeled out the clock with about 90 seconds left from the 30. If Dan Lanning was an asshole, he could have gone for it and made it 31 to 10, which would have looked a little better, right? Let's just, you know, let's look at all those things and be like, all right, it's not, it wasn't perfect. It wasn't great. It wasn't up to the standard, but it wasn't a dumpster fire like Florida State. This was such a weird game, Justin. One of the weirder Oregon games I've seen in recent memory because – you just kind of kept waiting as the game went on. Like, when is Oregon just going to dominate? You just kept waiting for that to come, and, and you never quite saw it, at least not on offense. That's the other strange thing. Oregon's defense had a heck of a day. Really, really strong showing from them, even though we didn't see a number of, of familiar faces as much as we probably anticipated, most notably Jeffrey Bossa and Justin Jacobs at linebacker, but we did get to see a lot of Devin Jackson and, and Bryce Betcher. We saw Tyler Turner get a lot of snaps at safety. That was another bit of a surprise. But for as dominant as the defense was, the offense just couldn't get into a rhythm. And the numbers clearly don't tell the whole story here, Justin, because 
even though they they had a, a solid statistical day from Dylan Gabriel, I think he had 380 yards passing through the ball 49 times, which was way more than I think anybody anticipated to see. He didn't have that much time to get settled in the pocket. The offensive line, I don't know if this is generous, but felt like they were getting dominated at times in that game. And, and sure, you can talk about, well, they they had some injuries with, with Matt Bedford and Dave Ayuli banged up, so they weren't at full strength. They they had Charlie Pickard, a, a former walk-on, as their starting center. They had a majority of their pieces, I guess, if you're just looking at the starting five, come back from a season ago. And it was just an ugly thing to watch because Oregon gave up only five sacks the entire year last season and then you see dylan gabriel go down three times against an fcs team so just a lot of really head scratching moments and takeaways from from this game that the ducks weren't able to get a consistent push i think they uh averaged 2.9 yards a carry with jordan james and noah whittington noah whittington played way more than i think either of us were expecting and we don't think we saw jay harris a single time so i don't want to be overly negative to, to get into this but Man, that was probably the ugliest win I've ever seen from Oregon, and I think that that's a pretty pretty soft way to put it. Yeah, it, it was it was an ugly win. Um, you know, it's a rough way to start the season, right? Because right now, you know, the hard part is that's our only sample size, right? That's that's what Oregon's being judged on right now is that game alone. They don't have two games, you know, three games. They could come out and completely demolish Boise State this weekend, and then maybe all of a sudden be like, okay. Maybe that was a one-off. People will feel better, obviously. Um, you know, frankly, I just need to win, but <laughs> it's the key. But, you know, it, it's just it, – it sucks that that's the only sample size we have right now. And what sucks is, you know, our our expectations, uh, you, me, the, the the readers on the message boards, the, the national pundits, our expectations for Oregon were completely different than kind of what we saw in the field. And, uh, you know, yeah, like let's be real. It, it's – the offensive line is the problem right now and it sucks to put it on those guys. It sucks to put them down, but let's be honest. If they were in a room looking at each other, they're probably saying, yeah, that was not a good performance by, by us. We, you know, we don't need to be patting ourselves on the back. We need to get out there and, and, and get better this week. So, and I don't think, I mean, yeah, they, they, they seemed a little, they seemed really lethargic for starters. I thought the, I know we got put on message board geniuses, but the, the hangover, you know, they look like they were a hangover, like they had a, a varsity blues moment, went to the strip club night four. That's funny. Obviously not true, but funny um, because let's be real. That, that is kind of what it looked like. And, um, you know, I know I looked down where I was sitting. I was an end zone seat uh, for, with my grandma. And, uh, you know, I could look down the whole the whole row of the bench. And, and uh, you know, I was looking over there multiple times. I just saw no juice, like, like nothing. I didn't see somebody over there, you know, basically yelling at guys and getting them fired up. Um, I, I just didn't see that. And that's my second biggest concern is, you know, I think Dylan Gabriel, if he's going to be the leader of this, of this football team, he's going to have to uh, come out of his shell. He's very much like Marcus Mariota. Um, but unfortunately, you know, for him, Mariota had several seasons at Oregon, where people just kind of, he was a quiet leader and he could get away with it. You know, Dylan Gabriel's only been on campus for eight months or, you know, seven, eight months, whatever it's been. Uh, so he doesn't have that rapport with the Oregon team just yet to kind of be that quiet leader. So I think he's going to have to come out of his shell a little bit and get the guys fired up. Uh, obviously you don't have like a JPJ on the offensive line, not just the talent. I'm talking about the leader because we know JPJ would have been yelling at guys and getting them going and firing up, firing them up. You kind of need that that captain there, uh, somebody that people look forward to. And I I don't think Johnny Cornelius or Josh Connerly are those guys. Certainly not Charlie Pickard. You know, they somebody there's gonna have to step up and be like, hey guys, let's get our shit together. Um, so you know, that's my second big, biggest concern. I'll close with this, at least on this topic. The the offensive line itself. Okay. They didn't forget how to play football, right? We saw a very good offensive line group last year. And ultimately, I know that it's a little bit different right now because of the of the injury to Bedford, but it sounds like we'll see Bedford within the next couple of weeks. And then it's going to take a little bit, of, like it's not going to be an instant, hey, they're instantly better, Bedford's back. There's no rust, you know what I mean? Like it's going to take some practices, but if they can get him back and maybe get him some reps this week, 
then you can maybe get him some more reps against Oregon State. Then maybe against UCLA, you might start to see that group kind of gel. If they can stay healthy, get better. Obviously, you'll have practices in between. Um, you know, so to me, I don't look to see that even if Bedford plays this weekend, which I'm not saying he will, even if he does, this group won't be infinitely better. It might take a step forward. And then I think, you know, him coming back, getting a little bit of rust off, another week of practice, and you know, and Poncho going back to center along with that, you know, they'll probably take a second step forward versus Oregon State. And then the goal is hopefully they're they're closer to that end product when you're, you know, maybe playing UCLA as your Big Ten opener down in L.A., uh, obviously getting ready for uh, Ohio State shortly after that. And I'll kind of give my final thoughts here on the offensive line as well, Justin, because I don't want to have the entire podcast be about that, but that's a, a, a deficiency or a concern right now, like we talked about coming out of this game. And for what we've seen from Malik Terry, just on the field in his press conferences in the, the ducks versus them videos, energy is probably the biggest word that comes to mind with him. And that is just not even close, nowhere in the same ballpark to what we saw on Saturday, which was just so strange to see. And to, to your point too, talking a little bit about Bedford, I don't know that they, we would have seen a drastically different result had he been able to go because sure, if he was able to go, maybe you have Poncho there at center, but he's only played one game as the starting center at Oregon. So the fact of the matter is the reality of the situation is to some degree, these guys just haven't played together very much. And I, I don't say that to excuse what we saw on the field, but it's like Will Stein said in fall camp, offensive line is a developmental position. So it's going to oh, take yeah. a lot of time to, to get that chemistry and, and get everybody on the same page. But it is kind of wild that we're at a point now, Justin, where it looks like we might see Matthew Bedford as, as soon as this week. He, he Dan Lanning was asked if he was optimistic that if Bedford and, and Gary Bryant could go this week against the Boise State Broncos, and, and he said that he is optimistic that it could happen. But again, not really a need to rush rush Bedford back. To be totally honest, I don't think they need Gary Bryant just yet but I think you'd take both of them if they are available to go. So that's going to be a big focal point for the Ducks this week is, is if that offensive line can bounce back. I tend to give Elite Terry the benefit of the doubt because it's not like he forgot to coach. And like you said, it's not like the players forgot to play offensive line and they just aren't good anymore. I think that uh, you go back to the drawing board and you see where you did some good, see where you did a lot of bad, and you try to move on. Well, and, and why I'm harping on this. So I, I think we agree on this. I think the defense was great, right? The defense was great. Um, you know, if you honestly kind of look at it, uh, you know, the defense got put in a couple tough spots with, you know, short field because, you know, Oregon went for it on fourth down, uh, whatever the case might be. Obviously, they had uh, the big trick play against them. If you look at it, it was kind of all gimmick stuff that Idaho got away with to put up a measly 10 points. Like if you – you know what I mean? And, and, and give them credit. They did it. But, you know, that defense was good. Why we're picking on or why I'm picking on the offensive line, at least I don't want to speak for you, is because to me, that is the engine of the offense right now. So, you know, why did Dylan Gabriel throw it 49 times? Well, Dylan Gabriel threw it 49 times because Oregon couldn't run the football. And you would see if you watch the game, you watch Idaho just kept crawling closer and closer to the line of scrimmage and stacking the box because they could see that Oregon couldn't effectively run the football, right? And a big part of that were the twists and stunts up front that Idaho was throwing at Oregon. They were it, it wasn't just that they got necessarily like pushed back. They literally were just missing assignments. Like there was no holes, there were no creases uh for the running backs. And I think, you know, you saw that just, you know, did, did you know, Johnny Cornelius, did he forget how to play football? No, but there was a lot of confusion amongst the offensive line about the blocking that they needed to do. And you could see that that just broke down and Idaho just kept coming forward and forward. So, you know, the, the reason we're picking, I think the offense can be good. Obviously they put up 500 yards, you know, Dylan Gabriel did not do a good job going through his progressions. Obviously he'd, he'd either lock onto a receiver or at, you know, at best he was going to like his second read was never getting in a third, fourth read. 
He looked at Tez Johnson a little bit too much. I'm sure they'll work on that this week. I think Evan Stewart needs to be a bigger part of the offense. But all of that is a byproduct of the pressure he was getting because of the offensive line. So it really, if they fix that, if they get it better, like it doesn't need to be perfect, but if they get it better and if they can be a more balanced offense because they can get some run push, because he can get a little bit more time, I think we'll see the offense back at that level that we expect. And if we can get that offense back at that level that we expect, paired with the defense we saw against Idaho, I think we see a version of Oregon that we probably more closely expected. So, again, these are all hypotheticals. That's what we're doing. But that's why everybody's picking on the offensive line. Tez Johnson did his job. The the tight ends did their job. I thought the running backs run ran really hard a little bit. Um, they tripped up a little bit here and there. Kind of expected in the first game. It's okay. They can fix that easily. So I, I think all the elements are there. Dylan Gabriel obviously was very effective, 41 of 49. That's pretty good football, whether they were short passes or long passes. Uh, clearly, uh, there's quarterbacks out there uh, nationally that are not able to be that effective uh, in college football. So, again, if they can just take those steps, right, I'm not expecting it to be fixed and perfect against Boise State this weekend, but maybe they take a step. And then they get out of that game, they win, they move on and they play Oregon State, and maybe they take another step, and we get closer to seeing that version of Oregon again that I think we're all – the standard, right? We're, we're going to get close to seeing the standard. To, to talk a bit more about Dylan Gabriel, Justin, that was not the debut that I think anybody expected, and, and it got off to a weird start. We know that uh, he hit his hand on an Idaho player's helmet early on in that game, and we saw him on the sideline kind of working it out, flexing it, and – I don't know. I kind of wonder if, if that maybe rattled him a little bit just because we didn't see that much of a downfield passing attack. I, I said that in my five takeaways. I said it was either downfield passing attack or deep ball disappears. It was something kind of cool with alliteration that I was happy about. But even if you're not converting those, we just didn't see shots like that many shots. And Lanning was asked about it on Monday and, and he said that, that they changed their coverage after they called a, a, a deep shot to De Evan Stewart. And then they kind of were preventing it. So I don't know if he was tipping his cap to Idaho or maybe trying to give Gabriel a little bit more credit. The, the big thing is you can't over analyze one game. I think there's, that's, there's so much doom and gloom on our boards. We all, we all know that right now, but I think even if you aren't converting those, I just want to see Gabriel just huck it, huck it downfield and give your wide receivers a, a couple of chances because I think the ball might have hit off Evan Stewart's hands or at least it was somewhat in the vicinity. It's not like it was way off. So I just want to see more aggressiveness from Gabriel. To his credit, he didn't turn the ball over, and I think that was growing increasingly important as the game went on because this was such a close one. So at least he took care of the ball. I think that's really you know job – 1A, 1B, right? Get the ball to your playmakers and take care of the ball for a quarterback. So, so that was something that was good to see. And then to, to kind of wrap up the offensive talk, Justin, I loved what we saw from the tight ends. I love that we saw a lot of Kenyon Sadiq in this game. We saw him early and often. I wasn't expecting to see as much of him as we did. We saw some three tight end sets from Will Stein, which I think is going to be super dangerous because – you can just put Terrence Ferguson and Patrick Herber as some big bodies out there in space to block for Kenyon Sadiq on some screens. So he's going to be a really special talent, and he was exciting to watch in, in probably his most action since he's gotten to Oregon. So he's someone that needs to touch the ball early, and he needs to touch the ball often because he is an absolute weapon for Will Stein. Yeah, I, um, <clears throat> I agree. I like the tight ends. I like the usage. Kenyon Sadiq was – um, I would say somewhat unsuccessful just because, you know, of the defense Idaho was playing and the way they were playing it. I think a lot of those plays will open up and, you know, I know we're kind of wrapping up here on, I would, I would urge duck fans to do this. Okay. And if you can, great for you throw, throw the first three quarters of the game out the window and go flip on the game in the fourth quarter only and watch the fourth quarter. Because if you do, you will see that outside of, of, of one slip up, a, a trick play, Oregon was dominant against Idaho. The, the offense kind of got a rhythm. Like, I think it was about nine or ten minutes in, they get the ball. And I believe they had uh, two possessions before they got the ball back with about 90 seconds and just kneeled it out. But if you look at the two possessions, you saw a different version of the Oregon offense. The run game got going a little bit more. 
Still wasn't great, but it got going a little bit more. And that opened up the passing game tremendously, and things were clicking. Like the offense was the offense was moving the ball really well uh, in the fourth quarter. So, you know, whether Idaho got tired, whether, you know, uh, you know, like I said, the run game just got going and the holes were getting created, whatever the case was, you know, it seemed to be uh, a little bit better after the first three or four minutes of the fourth quarter. And if you look at the game, you're like, okay, I, I can come away, you know, you know, feeling a little bit better. The hard part was, but by this time of the game and at this point, you know, we were so like just beaten up, like what is going on here for three quarters that I think that kind of went out the window. So, you know, maybe duck fans want to do that or don't go back and just watch the fourth quarter and just kind of see like, okay, I, I can see that things got cleaned up a little bit, even just in the game um, that will give me some optimism for next weekend. So, and again, if we had more of a sample size, we'd probably be having a different conversation. Unfortunately, we don't. We just have the one game for right now. And I think for for all the conversation about this is a small sample size, you also have to look at it as you can only play the games on your schedule. Like there was all of this hype around Oregon for the entirety of the offseason. I think to a degree it was merited. Some of it maybe wasn't merited after getting to watch this game, but Everyone talking about Oregon and across the country right now, this is what they have to look at. So if Oregon wants to change that, you go out and, and beat the heck out of Boise State if you can and make an effort to put your best foot forward. Um, we can get we can get to some more of the defense maybe when we talk about Boise State, Justin. I know we got some more stuff we want to get to on today's show. But if there's one defensive guy we have to talk about, I feel like it's Brandon Johnson because he had a heck of a debut in that Oregon uniform. Uh, got an interception in the end zone and was just kind of flying all over the field in that secondary for Chris Hampton. So he was one of the huge bright spots in, in a, a game that a lot of fans weren't too happy about. But gosh, he's going to be fun to watch. And I think he could very well end up being one of the biggest additions to this team this offseason because I've been pretty skeptical about the safety or, or nickel play these past couple of years. Yeah, it's uh, unfortunate that, you know, he was obviously uh, not a able to get to Oregon until the summer because you can only imagine how, how much better he'd be if he would have been able to go through spring uh, with the Ducks. But, yeah, huge bright spot there, uh, Brandon Johnson. I know that, um, you know, as you look at the transfer portal class that Oregon brought in, he was, you know, not one of the most discussed guys. And it looks like, you know, he's going to make an, a major impact. And, and the thing I liked about Brandon Johnson, obviously the interception, the great play, all that stuff. I, I mean, I, I think he might, I think he should have had a second interception on that, on that dual possession thing that uh, they ruled for Idaho. That was really dang close. i um, surprised they didn't review it because they reviewed every other play. That was another thing about the game. Like as you're there, there were so many reviews and like, I appreciate that. It's great. It totally killed the flow of the game. Like, and, and I don't think that's disgusting. I'm not picking on the officiating. Uh, there were some calls I didn't think maybe went the right way, but that was just my opinion. I'm not blaming the slow play of Oregon on bad calls. Like they needed to play better still. It just there. I mean, the first quarter I'm watching and literally every two minutes of gameplay we're stopping for a review, TV timeout, something like that. And I'm like, man, we're we're going to take forever doing this. So I feel like that hasn't been talked about. There was some game flow kill because of that. Um, but Brandon Johnson, back to him, what I like is the versatility of Brandon Johnson. He's a guy that you can, you know, put back uh, at safety. He's a guy that's obviously willing to come up into the box if he needs to. And you can put him at corner and it's not a liability. So – you know, there was, I think the one of the biggest discussions was, you know, the the absence or lack of participation from Taishim Johnson. And if, if if you go and look at it, Brandon Johnson is a more versatile player than Taishim Johnson. Taishim's kind of one-dimensional. He's a little bit more of an enforcer. It's great to have an enforcer out there, but, you know, if you can have a guy like Brandon Johnson and, and Kobe Savage and, you know, get those guys back there, man, Oregon's, you know, ability to, to cover the pass was Re really good they often had you know guys uh, two guys you know on or near the football when the ball was in the air um and, and you couple that with Devin Jackson and I know that he was filling in and he wasn't perfect missed some missed some lanes and, and did some things but 
man, that guy is just ridiculously fast. I mean, you could see in some of his pursuit, it was like, oh, dude, he just closed that gap in a hurry. And so, you know, in obvious passing situations, if you're looking to bring some pressure and you got a weapon like Devin Jackson back there that can come off the edge or through the middle or something, you know, wow, between between all those guys, I, I, I was I was really impressed with the defense. And Brandon Johnson was probably one of the biggest highlights. There goes a firefighting plane. You can hear it, I'm sure. Uh, and then Mateo, obviously, Uyunglele was like, if he'd have played more snaps, he might have had five sacks out there. It was It was pretty unreal. Brandon Johnson and Mateo Uyunglele among the many defensive standouts for Oregon in a 24-14 to win over the Idaho Vandals. Before we continue on today's show, I want to give a big thank you and a shout-out to one of our sponsors here on the pod, Ranchito Grill in Springfield. Not sure what your guys' dinner plans are tonight, but head on over to Ranchito at 1537 Mohawk Boulevard. You got to give their homemade tortillas a try. They got great food, a great environment, and they will take care of you. Say what's up to my guy, Ruben, and let him know that Max Torres sent you. Before, before you we get turn- going, before you get going, I went to Ranchito for the first time on Friday. My guy Ruben took care of me. Funny story. Ruben came out. There were some duck fans. I met with some other duck fans. It was nice. We were out on the patio. It was beautiful. Okay. It was the first time I'd been there and I need to go more. Uh, but there's so many great places in Eugene and that's one of them. Um, funny story. We sit there and it was, it was my wife, Kim, and my daughter and um, we're ordering food. And I'm not really paying attention. I'm kind of talking to duck fans or whatever. And, and uh, she's ordering and she orders. I don't remember what she ordered. Doesn't matter. And uh, she orders corn tortillas. And and Ruben, J-Hop, your wife just ordered the corn tortillas. <laughs> I was like, and I was I wasn't totally paying attention. And I'm like, what? He goes, she just ordered the corn tortillas. I'm like, no, you gotta get the flour tortillas. That's the thing, man. And she's like, oh, okay, I didn't. And so normally fl- flour tortillas uh, we prefer, but a lot of places just go buy them at Walmart or whatever and and feed them to you. Ruben's not lying. Those are legit homemade flour tortillas and they are phenomenal i mean like they're so good that you could just warm them up and put some butter on them and eat them they're that good so I, the, the flour tortillas are legit everything else is really good margarita was good i had beer beer's good uh go check it out i'm not just saying that i paid for my food it's awesome go for it there you go there you go we got a first-hand testimonial from J-Hop on Ranchito Grill and the homemade tortillas. I can't wait to get some myself when I'm back in Eugene for the Ohio State game on October 12th. Let's zoom out, Justin, before we turn the page completely from week one and talk Boise State. Let's look at week one and the week that was inside the top 10. I know you wrote your top 10 over on Scoop Duck, so maybe I'll just toss it up to you to uh, let you lead this one. Yeah, you know, we don't need to go through the top five team by team. You know, there were some upsets in college football. There were other teams that that were similar to Oregon in the fact that they were a little bit sluggish, maybe, you know, struggled against, uh, you know, lesser competition. Again, that's why you play those game ones. I love that, you know, I love that we saw LSU and USC playing. I love that Georgia was playing Clemson. I love the big games as much as anybody else, right? But there's a reason you schedule the tune-ups, right? Uh, you know, so Georgia obviously kicked the crap out of Clemson. Clemson's just not that good. Let's be honest. Clemson is just not that good. I didn't think they would be that good. They validated my belief. They could probably still compete and win the ACC because let's be clear, the ACC is not very good. Miami, NC State, a couple of good teams there, but Clemson's not that great. Um, you know, I don't know. Maybe I'm not giving Georgia Tech enough credit either because they, uh, obviously beat Florida state, which isn't saying much right now, but yeah, Georgia right now looks like the most complete team. I think anybody that ranks anybody ahead of Georgia just didn't watch, just didn't watch them play. I just don't think it's fair. You know, Ohio state did what they needed to do. Keep in mind, it was a slow start for Ohio state. Like obviously they got rolling in the second half. uh, And even like the second half of second quarter, they were not that sharp offensively to start the game. So I I don't know if anybody watched them. I did a little bit and uh, you know, they, they were not, completely dominant Texas. I got them at number three because you have to, but I still think they could slip up. Uh, I guess I'm going to go through them. Ole Miss. I think people are sleeping on Ole Miss. That might be the number two team in the country. I don't know if, I don't think anybody watched them and they should have. Ole Miss played a complete game on both sides of the ball. They are killers on offense. They went to the transfer portal, killed it. Dude, that might be the number two team in the country right now. Alabama, 
Obviously, big debut from Kalen DeBoer. Uh, Jalen Monroe, still not very good, but they got a lot of good guys on defense and they got a run game. So, Oregon, I pushed this down to six. You know, I think, you know, I had Oregon at, at three, um, and I, I called it 2A and 2B is what I called it back in the spring with Ohio State and Oregon. Moving down to six, and I, I, I don't know how you don't, right? Like, it wasn't a great performance. They shouldn't be rewarded. Um, that's one of the big flaws in college football, in my opinion, is that, you know, guys get, you know, uh, ranked high early, kind of underperform and underperform, but continue to win and get rewarded for it. I don't think you should. So I don't think, I think dropping Oregon out of the top 10 completely is an overreaction. And we talked, I talked about overreaction Sunday. I think keep, keeping them at six is fair. Miami, obviously a big win, but Florida sucks. Don't take too much from that. Uh, Tennessee, Nico, dude, Nico. Man, he was killing it. Can he keep it up for a whole season? I don't know, but if they do, that's a hell of an offense there. Penn State still got my doubts. I don't. Eh, we'll see. I, I think I think they'll have a couple losses in the big. Uh, Notre Dame. I don't think Texas A&M is all that good. So good win for them, but eh. so you know from that, and I'll let you pick on it. I put a next five in because of this because I think basically. After Oregon at six, I think seven through ten are interchangeable, complete like completely interchangeable. And beyond that, I think the next five, if anybody said, "Hey, I've got USC at, at seven, or I've got Oklahoma at seven, or I've got USC at nine, not going to get a bunch of debate for me. It's one you know one game sample size for almost everybody out there. Uh, I, I'm not going to overreact one way or another. But USC looked good. LSU is not that good. Let's be honest. Utah probably going to win the Big Twelve if I had to guess. Missouri, Oklahoma, Michigan all looked good. So um, it's early in the season. Let's not overreact. So I'll hop on, on a couple of these games that I was able to uh, take in. The first one, well, let's talk about Oregon just for a second, I guess. I'm on the same page as you. That was a, a really ugly game, at least if you're looking at the totality of it. So I think you are correct to penalize the Ducks there a bit, but let's not go crazy because they did still win. And then Miami and Florida was an interesting game to watch. I mean, God, it's going to be tough out there in Gainesville for Billy Napier and the Gators because they that was a game they needed to win. I'm not saying I expected them to win, but, God, they really needed it. Cam Ward at Miami. They might go 1-11. and 11. <laughs> Dead man we'll walking. To see. We will have to see. Um, to, to talk about Cam Ward, he had a great game for for the Hurricanes in his, his first game as – uh, a member of the ACC transferring over from Washington State. He just looks so smooth and, and calm and collected. He had one run where he was basically just coasting up the sideline and just kind of one of those runs that you look at the defender. It's like, oh, yeah, no, I just ran it. You're not going to touch me. But he looks awesome. He's one of the funnest guys to watch when the plays break down. Was Miami one quarterback away? I don't know. But – he showed why he was one of the most sought after quarterbacks in the transfer portal and, and Miami looked pretty solid in that game for sure. Um, they also had Miami players that were going over to the Florida recruits and saying, don't go here, come to Miami, which I thought was pretty badass. Um, but again, just to the point that they really needed to get that win, uh, the, the Gators did, but that was a fun one to watch. I think Miami, is going to be fun to follow, obviously, with Mario Cristobal at the helm there. And then the other one that I want to talk about that I was able to see a pretty good amount of was USC and LSU uh, out there in Las Vegas to kick things off. I think I was maybe a little bit more high on SC than you were when we were talking a little bit before we recorded, Justin. But in the same note where you talked about Florida needing that win, USC really needed that win because everybody was super skeptical about them all off season. We knew the defense was a dumpster fire last year. Grinch is gone. Danton Lynn takes over that defense out in L.A. Miller Moss succeeds. Caleb Williams, the number one overall draft pick from a year ago. And Miller Moss looked great. The, the Trojans looked pretty physical. I think that that was my biggest question mark coming into this game. Were they going to be able to match LSU's physicality? Certainly, we know all about their offensive line out there in Baton Rouge. Both of their bookend tackles have been very, very touted throughout the offseason. And USC's got some great playmakers. I mean, I know our our readers and listeners aren't going to like to hear about it, but you got to give credit where it's due. Zachariah Branch is an absolute freak. Um, Jacoby Lane had some really nice plays as well. 
So you expect that from USC to be a great offense, but is there a leap that they kind of appear to have made? Or maybe I shouldn't even call it a leap. Does their improvement, is that something that's going to be able to stick as the season goes? And is their defensive line going to be able to sustain what we see every week in the Big Ten? We know that that physicality is a big talking point. So I think maybe I would throw USC in the top 10 potentially, um, but they're, they're going to be fun to watch this year. And I think that uh, it'll be cool to see what they can do moving forward here as, uh, as the season goes on. Yeah. You know, and I'm, I'm looking, I'm on my computer cause I, I would never remember this because I have a terrible memory, but um, first of all, I just, I, I continue to, and I even tweeted this. I think Brian Kelly is one of the bigger, you know, frauds in college football as a coach. Uh, I think if I recall correctly, the stat is he's 0-3 in season openers at LSU. The difference this year is he – I think Garrett Nussmeyer is a good quarterback, but they clearly don't have Jaden Daniels, which, you know, his, his his dual threat ability really opened up that offense. Uh, and don't forget they had some, you know, first round, early round NFL wide receivers on that roster last year. I just, you know, I just don't know that LSU is a good team. Um, and I, and I look at this, I'm looking at it. They play Ole Miss. Uh, they play Arkansas who absolutely blew the doors off in the opener this year. Who knows? They're not ranked, but uh, I think people are sleeping there. Uh, they play Alabama. They play Vanderbilt who obviously, uh, you know, shocked a lot of us and they play Oklahoma to finish the year. So LSU is looking at a, at a tough schedule. You know, they'll get on the track track here more than likely beat Nichols. And, you know, South Carolina in a couple of weeks, they got a shot there, UCLA, South Alabama. They could get themselves to four and one pretty easily. One, two, three, four. Yeah, four and one pretty easily. Uh, but then, you know, it's Ole Miss, Arkansas, A&M, Bama, uh, Florida, all in a row. Uh, you know, so the back half of that season is tough for them. USC, I worry about their depth. If they could stay healthy like they were uh, yesterday. Yeah, the game was yesterday. If they could stay healthy. Uh, you know, that was a good looking team out there, uh, but they don't have depth, right? So any injury there uh, along the line of scrimmage, uh, any injury probably in their secondary or linebacker is going to be a huge problem for them. Uh, and I, I feel as though USC beat up a highly ranked opponent that quite frankly, wasn't that good and shouldn't have been ranked there. So I think we'll get a better feel maybe for USC again, trying not to overreact to a small sample size we'll get a, a better feel for USC in two weeks when they uh, head to Ann Arbor and play Michigan. So, um, you know, a lot of football left to be played. I'm super excited about it. Um, one thing I want to throw in, you and I are recruiting guys, right? You know, and we were just, you know, talking about Florida and Billy Napier. It's only week one. Okay. That guy's a dead man walking. He's done. Billy Napier's done. There's Is Jed Fish going to be the next guy? Right. Jed Fish. Do they throw some money at Dan Lanning, which – whatever it'll be arbitrary if they do it doesn't matter you know who, who do they go get right do they go throw the kitchen sink at mario cristobal and he leaves miami for florida i probably not but you get my point here we are recruiting guys and we've been saying look oregon missed on some guys some guys committed elsewhere had a couple flips stay patient right because we're already talking about lsu maybe not being a very good football team this year and then what's the what's the fallout from that you know we're talking about florida already in Deep trouble, and Billy Napier probably, you know, more than likely being fired at the end of the year. What's the recruiting fallout from that? That's my point. That's why you and I were trying to preach to the the boards, you know, stay patient. Don't worry about who committed where. Texas A&M came out of the gates a little bit flat. What does that mean for Noah McHale and some of those guys? Oregon was on. We don't know. Those guys aren't going to overreact either and decommit just because Texas A&M lost its first football game. That's not what's going to happen. But – Maybe Texas A&M only wins five football games this year. We don't know. Maybe, you know, Florida's going to change coaches. Who takes that job? Maybe they pull, you know, Josh Heupel from Tennessee. You know, I don't know. And then that would be. So just stay patient because the chaos is going to happen. Oregon's sitting pretty. They've got money in the bank that they can, uh, you know, make some attractive NIL offers with. And again, this was only week one, right? So, you know, just let this season play out. Oregon can stay on track and hopefully – some of this chaos can lead to some, you know, recruiting wins for the Ducks later on. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up recruiting, Justin, because the Ducks did have a bit of a surprise visitor 
in town for the Idaho game. That is 2025 Texas linebacker commit Elijah Bo Barnes out of Skyline High in the Dallas area. I was able to catch up with him, and that trip went great. It was his first trip out to Eugene. A, a bit of a last-minute visit that Rashad Samples helped orchestrate, and, and he said some pretty good things about that trip. So go on over to scoopduck.com if you want to read up that interview. Uh, it is one of our premium stories, so uh, you know, good reason to subscribe and, and check us out to get the best in Oregon football and recruiting. We'll talk a little bit of Boise State to wrap us up here, Justin. Uh, I do want to just mention on the pod that we are trying to get a little bit more national at times in the show. Obviously, you guys are here for, for Oregon talk, but there's so much going on in this amazing sport that we all love. So I want to try to sprinkle in a little bit of uh, news around the sport moving forward here with the season underway. But let's turn uh, our attention to week two as Oregon prepares to welcome the Boise State Broncos to Eugene for a Saturday night kick, 7 o'clock on Peacock. Interesting stat. I don't know why I didn't know this, Justin, but Oregon has never beaten Boise State. I know, of course, about the infamous LeGarrette Blunt punch uh, against uh, uh, Boise State, and then the Ducks last played the Broncos in the 2017 Las Vegas Bowl, a game that the Broncos won 38-28. to But now the Ducks get them at home in Eugene, looking to bounce back. And Boise State's a pretty solid team in their own right. And I think they're usually really well coached. They got a win in week one, 56 to 45 over Georgia Southern, a game that was highlighted by Ashton Genty, 20 carries for 267 yards and six touchdowns. So that's a great story. But for me, I think I'm looking at this box score and saying, wow, you gave up 45 points to Georgia Southern. That's a little bit of a surprise but uh, a, a, an increase or an improvement in opponent for Dan Lanning and the Ducks heading into week two. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, 0-3 against Boise State. So it, it kind of feels like Oregon's due, right? I hope and I'm confident that Dan Lanning's, you know, pounding on that all week. Like, hey, we've never beaten these guys. Don't 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 lump them in with Idaho like you did week one and, and sleepwalk and and I'm certain, you know, I, I, I absolutely can't envision, I just can't, under Dan Lanning, that Oregon walks out on the field and sleep sleepwalks, you know, for a second straight game. I believe that they did against Idaho. I don't believe they will against Boise State, and I hope I'm right. Hopefully I'm not just being a, a homer. Um, but I'm, I'm trusting in Lanning and his ability to get the team fired up. And, yeah, I mean, obviously Ashton Genty is going to be the, the focus if you're Oregon. I, I don't think – I think you're going to put the ball in Maddox's hands and dare him to beat you. And, I, and I'm not sure that he has that capability because obviously, you know, Boise State did uh, pound the rock. He had, what, just shy of 300 yards, I think, of offense. 267. Himself. Yeah, Ashton Genty, and he had six touchdowns. So, I mean, that one player accounted for like 80% of your offense, 75% of your offense. So, you know, if you're Oregon's defense, I think you're going to key on him there. A very bright spot that we saw was Oregon held up very well against the run against Idaho. Again, small sample size. It was Idaho. Let's not overreact, but they didn't get gashed on the ground against Idaho. So um, that's a good thing there. And like you said, your point, 45 points against Georgia Southern. I mean, even a a very poor offensive performance for Oregon, you know, put up 24 points and, and almost 500 yards. So I got to think that that defense is probably going to get picked apart. Hopefully that leads to some more explosive plays because like many fans, like honestly, like the, the coaching staff even said, the lack of explosive plays was a little bit of a concern versus Idaho. Maybe we can see that uh, changed versus Boise state. So I know, I think the line was originally at like 24 points. It got hammered down at somewhere around 19 now. I think it was 20 by Sunday and it's, it's down to 19 or so today, I believe. So, you know, clearly there is a level of concern around Oregon's offensive output um, heading into week two against Boise state. I tell you what, uh, disregard rankings, anything, the smartest people in the room anytime are, are the Vegas is Vegas because there's money on the line. So when they set a line, when they set an over under, I always pay attention to them way more than anything else because those guys, you know, those guys got it figured out and there's big money on the line for doing that. So personally, 
I, I think you hammer Oregon. I think they're going to be able to beat this team by more than 20. I hope I'm right. I hope I'm not just being a homer. Um, but I think Oregon's going to be able to take a step forward with the offensive line. And even if it's 15% better or 20% better, it's going to be enough for the, the uh, explosive plays to open up. And I think it's going to be enough for get them to get the run game going against Boise as well. I certainly think Oregon's offense can get back on the right page, on the right trajectory in week two against the Broncos. I, for one, am anticipating a big game from Jeffrey Bossa, who we didn't see much from last week. But Dan Lenning said in the post game, or maybe it was last night, I think it was the post game, that it was more of a decision like, do we really need Jeff? in this game. And I think when you're going up against a running back of Gen T's caliber, uh, you're going to expect a big game from your middle linebacker and that's Jeffrey Bossa. So that's one of the kind of things I have my eye on heading into this matchup. But uh, Justin, any final thoughts here before we get out of here? Uh, no, uh, I don't think so. Yeah. I, I just, I, I feel, I feel like we're going to see a different version of Oregon this week. I think Boise state's going to be a tough test. I think, you know, if Oregon's able to get a big win here, I think fans need to not take that lightly because Boise State is is being picked by a lot of national guys to be the 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 G5 representative in the college football playoff. So, um, you know, I've seen it several times, uh, you know, whether that changes or whatnot, um, you know, don't sleep on Boise. This is a good football team and, and Ashton Genty is a legit running back. That's an NFL guy. I want to say this as well. Um, I'm totally, I'm not blanking on his name. I know the last name was Lane, but the quarterback from Idaho uh, that Oregon just played. Jack Lane. Jack Lane, yeah. Uh, he's injured. He's going to miss the next couple of weeks. So make sure we don't overreact about what we saw from Oregon against Idaho in week one, because that will be a completely different Idaho on offense moving forward for the next couple of weeks. So kind of a bummer that like that version of Idaho won't get to play for the next couple of weeks. And then maybe fans might be like, Oh, maybe Idaho wasn't that bad. They're going to be a lot different because their starting quarterback just went down. I didn't, I didn't, it was two or three weeks. It was something like that. I saw that he got hurt, but yeah, I didn't know the, the amount myself either. So we'll, we'll see what what's going on with the Vandals from afar. Going to be back tomorrow is the plan with Travis Rookley for our weekly mailbag episode of the podcast. So, if you're a Scoop Duck subscriber, keep an eye on the boards. Travis or myself will put out a post and ask for some questions. And you can also get us those questions over on Twitter. If you want to find more of Justin, you can follow him on Twitter slash X at jhopkinssd. You can follow me on any social media platform at mtorussports. Subscribe to the Scoop Duck on 3 YouTube channel. And come and see us at scoopduck.com for the best in Oregon football and recruiting. But until next time, thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of the Duck's Dish Podcast.